So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. And for now, you can go ahead and just hold your place there. But before we jump into our text this morning, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever stopped and taken time to look back over your life and then carefully reflected on God's faithfulness and his gracious providence throughout your time on this earth? And by faithfulness, I mean, seeing how steadfastly God has kept his promises in his word throughout every high and low season of your life. Can you testify that God has been faithful? And by his gracious providence, what I mean is, can you trace how God has intricately and sovereignly worked through the many minute details and decisions uh, that you have faced over the years and the many different life circumstances and choices you've made? directing you and leading you to ultimately fulfill his purposes in your life. And I want us all to stop and think about this for just a moment. When was the last time that you did this? If we're being honest with each other this morning, the reality for most of us, including myself, is that we tend to normally be spiritually nearsighted people. We habitually neglect to look back and remember or even recognize God's faithfulness and his careful involvement in the most intricate details of our lives. Our nearsightedness also keeps us from anticipating and asking for God to providentially intercede and work in the present and in the future, trusting that in every scenario, he is continually shaping us and preparing us for eternity with him. The truth of the matter is that on average, we spend much of our time focusing on the uncertainties of the little things that are immediately in front of us. And as a result of that, our faith and our confidence in God becomes frail and small as our worry leads us to begin to doubt God's faithfulness and his sovereign and tender providence in our lives. And while I believe that this is most likely the average scenario for most of us in the room today, I do also want to recognize that for some of you here, I know that you are facing some of the, the, the most difficult things and seasons and trials that you've ever faced in your life. And so no matter what season you find yourself in today, uh, what I want us to see is that if we believe and see that God is truly uh, faithful and his love is unchanging for his people, then we will trust in his providence in our lives. And so the title of my message this morning is Trust in the Providence of God. And my hope and prayer uh, is that as we look at this story together in Genesis 24, we will see that those who trust in God's providence will pursue God's will for their lives, they will pray for his guidance, They will praise him for his answered prayer, and they will proclaim his faithfulness to those around them. And so let's go to the Lord together in prayer before we get into that. Heavenly Father, uh, you are Lord over all creation. Uh, You are the sovereign God, that everything uh, happens according to your will, to your plan. And so when we can't see, when we don't understand, would you still help us to trust in you, that you are just, that you are righteous, that you are faithful, and that your promises to your people are unchanging, and we can rest and find comfort in that. Now every season that we face, even when it's the most difficult seasons of our lives, we have the hope that you make all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so you use every uh, circumstance in our life providentially to conform us more into the image of your son and to trust him. And so would you help us as we look at your word to do just that. Help us to trust you more. We pray in the name of your son. Amen. Well, before we jump into our text, I just want to recap our study through the life of Abraham. If you've been following along with us in our Genesis series, you'll know that for the past 10 weeks, we've looked at the life of Abraham, and you'll remember the many ups and downs that Abraham has had along the way. Like you and I at times often do, Abraham sometimes failed to trust God when his faith was tested. But God is gracious, 
And Abraham learned over the years that God was truly trustworthy as he watched time and time again God do some miraculous, faithful things as he fulfilled his promises that he had made to him. So Abraham's faith in God greatly increased as he witnessed God's miraculous miracle of providentially opening the womb of Sarah despite her old age. And at the exact time that he actually said he would do that. And so listen to how chapter 21 verses 1 through 2 recounts this miracle. It says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. So God sovereignly opened the womb of Sarah at the appointed time that he saw fit. And Abraham learned to confidently trust in the providence of God. Abraham demonstrated his confidence and faith in God once again in chapter 22, as God tested Abraham by asking him to sacrificially offer up his son Isaac, the very offspring that God had promised to give to Abraham, who God said through whom all of the nations of the world would be blessed. But Abraham doesn't argue with God in this test. He trusts him. And God provides a ram for the sacrifice. And so years go by as Abraham continues to walk with God and trust in his providence. Last week, we saw how Abraham trusted God through the death and burial of his beloved wife, Sarah, as in faith, he purchased a burial ground for his future family and the land that God had promised to give to him. And so this is where our text will pick up today. So go ahead now and open with me to Genesis 24 And we'll start with verses 1 through 9. It says this, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which I came, or which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. And so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So what exactly is happening here in this story? Well, several important things are interwoven throughout uh, these nine verses that set up our narrative for today and that we need to pay attention to. So first we see in verse 1 that Abraham is well advanced in years. And well, why does that matter? Because Abraham knows that his time left on this earth is running out. And he is burdened uh, with the fatherly task of finding his son a wife before his time runs out. You see, in this culture, the father of the house normally would pick a wife and arrange a marriage for his sons. And what we need to realize, however is that Abraham has a deeper underlying desire and concern here than just finding Isaac a wife. Abraham is primarily concerned with uh, seeing God's covenant fulfilled while he is still alive. Abraham knew and believed that God would fulfill his promise to bring forth countless offspring through his son Isaac. And this is what God had told him earlier in chapter 17, 19, where he states, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And so if God had promised to establish his covenant with Isaac, well, why hadn't Abraham's marriage already been arranged? And this is where we get into another issue here in this story. You see, God led Abraham to the land of Canaan, And the land that God had promised to give to Abraham and his offspring was this land. And so while this land had plenty of young women inhabiting it, they weren't the type of women that Isaac should be marrying, and Abraham knew that. Throughout the Old Testament, Canaanites were frequently known for their wickedness. Abraham needed to find a wife for Isaac who would honor and worship the true and living God, 
Not a pagan who would bring idolatry into the house of Isaac and lure him away from the God of the covenant. And so this was Abraham's task as a father. In chapter 18, 19, look at what God had said to him. He said that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. And so this brings me to our first point of our message this morning. It says, those who trust in God's providence will pursue God's will for their lives. Those who trust in God's providence will pursue God's revealed will for their lives. And so here's uh, where we see how Abraham trusted in God to fulfill his covenant as he relied on God's providence while he was faithful to obey God's will for his life and for his son Isaac's. Abraham knew that the best prospects for a godly wife would be found in his hometown. And get this, it was 550 miles away. He knew that arranging a marriage for Isaac from the Canaanites would go against God's will for him to command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. But Abraham is old though. And so this journey is not going to be physically possible for him to make. And so he calls his eldest servant and commissions him with this great task. Let's look again uh, at verses 2 through 9. It says, And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Now, this scenario might seem weird to us today, and I don't recommend that you try this next time you want to make an oath with someone. Uh, But this idea of placing one's hand under the thigh was an ancient way of swearing an oath and binding oneself to faithfully fulfill the request of the commissioner. And what we need to catch here in this section is the confidence and faith that Abraham had in God's providence. You see, Abraham had once failed at trusting God to provide for him a son, and so he took matters into his own hands, going against God's will for his life, and he had Hagar, his servant, bear him a son. But now, his confidence in God's steadfast love, faithfulness, and providence has significantly grown. And so he doesn't force a marriage to happen, but knows and trusts that God will provide Isaac a godly wife at the right time. And we see this confidence in God clearly in verses 5 through 9, where the servant states, But perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. But Abraham responds, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. You see, Abraham doesn't know if this will be the time that God provides a wife for Isaac. And so he gives his servant an out, trusting that if no woman is willing to marry Isaac at this time, then God will certainly provide the right woman in his proper timing. Abraham trusted that God would direct the path of his servant and lead him to the right woman. We also need to see here that Abraham's faith in God's providence was also demonstrated in his desire to make sure that Isaac remained in Canaan and would never return to Abraham's homeland. And this was because God had promised to give Abraham and to his offspring the land of Canaan, which was to be the future dwelling place of all of Abraham's descendants. Abraham wanted to make sure that Isaac remained in the land that God had blessed him with and knew that if Isaac made the 550-mile journey to Mesopotamia... He might be tempted to abandon the promised land that God had given to him. And so if I could summarize this entire section here, this is what I want us to see. Trusting in God's providence does not mean that we live idle lives, sitting around and waiting for God to do whatever he is going to do. 
Trusting in God's providence means that we actively pursue the desires that he has placed in our lives. But we uh, submit those desires under his commanded will, the things that God has told us to do through his word, while we patiently trust in his sovereign will, or in other words, his providence, knowing that God will accomplish all that he purposes at the time that he sees fit, and he will do what he sees best in our lives. So let me once again recall our first point. Those who trust in God's providence will pursue God's revealed will for their lives. And so I don't know where you might be at this morning. You might be desiring a new job or feel frustrated that you cannot find a godly spouse in the Bay Area. Or maybe you want to see your kids get into a certain college. But whatever decision or desire you are facing, test to see if it lines up with, with or contradicts God's commanded will. And if it doesn't contradict his commanded will for your life, then pursue those desires, trusting that God will sovereignly and providentially direct your steps. Now, as we move on from this section, I just want to remind us of this familiar passage, and I hope that you see it in a different light as it connects with this narrative we are studying together. Look with me at Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So as we continue on in our text together this morning, we're going to see that Abraham actually is not the main character here in this narrative. And while we spent some time setting up the scene in this narrative, what I want us to see as we move forward through the rest of the story is the incredible faithfulness and faith that Abraham's servant had in the Lord, the covenant-making God of heaven and in his providence. So look with me now at verses 10 through 27, and we're going to see how Abraham's servant places his full confidence and trust in the faithfulness and providence of God. It says this in verse 10. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. Now let's just pause briefly and look at what's happening here. We have to commend the servant's shrewdness because this guy was pretty smart. He went straight to the place where he knew all of the young single women would be gathering, the city well. And while this would be the perfect place to get to know the women in the area, it also actually causes a problem for the servant. Because how in the world was he going to filter through all of these women and find the right one who would be willing to marry his master's son. And so let's look at what the the servant does next in verse 12. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink, And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Now what do we see happening here? What does this servant do when he's faced with this great decision? Yes, he prays for God to guide him. And so this leads me to my second point. Those who trust in God's providence will pray for his guidance over the decisions that they have to face in their lives. What an example the servant leaves us in the story. He prays. I wonder how many times I have struggled with doubt over God's faithfulness because I've lacked the time to pray for his will and his guidance and his providence in the many different areas of my life. Of my life. This servant wanted to make sure that the woman he picked would be the best woman for his master's servant. And so he asked God to providentially lead the right woman to do something rather extreme. He prays that she would not only offer him water to drink, but that she would voluntarily water his ten camels as well. And so why is that sign significant? Because camels can drink, get this, 25 gallons apiece. So if all 10 camels were extremely thirsty, which I imagine they probably were because they just made a 550-mile journey, then this woman would be volunteering to draw out a lot of water. 
like up to 250 gallons worth of water. And so this would not be a normal task that you just voluntarily do, especially for a stranger. But I believe the servant is asking God to reveal to him a woman of character who was not just beautiful on the outside, but who had a heart of hospitality, selflessness, and service. God would truly have to move the heart of this woman to do such a selfless task. But what if he missed the sign somehow or second-guessed himself? Did the providence of God and the fulfillment of God's covenant hinge on whether or not this man saw the sign that he had asked for? So what we need to understand is that God's providence in our lives is not dependent on whether or not we pray. He does whatever he wishes to do. Listen to how uh, Psalm 115 puts it. It says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. I believe that if it was God's will for the servant to find Isaac's wife at this well, then he would do just that, regardless of whether or not he had asked God to providentially lead her to him. And so some of you might ask, well, if God is providentially working despite whether or not I pray, then why even bother praying? And so let me encourage you with this. We pray because God loves to use our prayers to reveal to us how greatly he cares for us to show us that he is indeed intricately working in the smallest details of our lives. We pray because God uses prayer as part of his sovereign plan to shape and align our hearts to trust in him as he providentially works in our lives, even when we don't always see it. And don't miss this, church. We pray because it means it is a means that God uses to show us how great his steadfast love is for us. I mean, listen to how the servant put it in verse 13. He says, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. See, the servant relied on God's steadfast, loyal, covenantal love, which he no doubt had come to experience and trust in himself as he watched how God had blessed Abraham greatly and how he had faithfully fulfilled every promise that he had made to Abraham over the years. So let's continue on in verses 15 through 25 as we see what happens next. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. And then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. And so she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to, to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. And the man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. And when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels. And he said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. Now I love this part of the narrative so much. Because it truly reveals to us the providential hand of God. Before the, finished had even, the, before the servant had even finished speaking, God answered his prayer. Isn't that amazing? And what we need to realize is that God had already providentially sent Rebecca to go and draw water at the exact time that he wanted her to appear before the servant. And so again, I, I just want to stress that God would have led Rebecca to the servant regardless of whether or not he had prayed for God to lead him. Look with me at verse 26, though, and let's see how he responds. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. Verse 27. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. So this takes me to my third point. In my message this morning, it says, those who trust in God's providence will praise him for his answered prayers. 
And this is an important note that I don't want us to miss. When we pray for God to work in the minute details of our lives, when we pray for God to lead us in the decisions we make, we will start to see more and more how he faithfully answers our prayers and is providentially working in our lives. This not only causes our faith in him to increase in seasons where we cannot see his providential hand working, but the heart of the believer who experiences this kind of grace will be moved to humble and reverent praise and worship as we thank God for his faithfulness and his undeserved loyal love that he is so willing to lavish on us. But when we refuse to pray, to seek God's providential hand in our lives, the more we sit idly by, we actually rob God of praise and glory that he deserves. Imagine how many opportunities that we have missed for seeing and experiencing God's providential hand and therefore overflowing in praise because of our lack of faith that he actually does love us with a steadfast, loyal love and he is working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Well, let's continue on now as we see how the rest of this narrative plays out. Read with me uh, verses 28 through 49. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about all of these things. Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets of his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. And so the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. And he said, speak on. And so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, drink and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had even finished speaking in my heart, Behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camel's drink also. And so I drank, and she gave the camel's drink also. And then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, from Milcah, before, uh, whom Milcah bore to him. And so I put a ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And so this brings me to my fourth and final point in the message today. Those who trust in God's providence proclaim his faithfulness to those around them. I mean, can you just picture the excitement and anticipation on the face of the servant here? He has been so amazed and blown away at God's providence that he cannot contain himself. He tells Rebecca's family every single detail testifying of the Lord's faithfulness. He even refuses to eat until he has retold the entire account in great detail. Church, there is much that we can learn here from the servant. 
Our overflow of praise as a result of God's gracious providence in our lives should lead us to a a bold proclamation of God's steadfast love and faithfulness to the world around us. How many opportunities have you and I missed to proclaim God's faithfulness, to build up faith in one another because we weren't looking to see God's providence working in our lives? Well, let's continue on in our text as we see how Laban responds to the servant's proclamation, starting in verse 50. It says, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So let me stop real quick and just say this. In this culture, um, the oldest brother would be the one who would have to approve of anyone interested in marrying one of his sisters, which I think probably should have kept that practice around because I, as an older brother, have a younger sister and, uh, and she's probably not watching this, so I can say this. Um, there are many times where I wish that I had the final say in the uh, men that she has chose to bring into uh, my parents' home, but that's not where we uh, land today, but that's where they landed back then, so let's keep going, okay? So uh, the point is this, though. It would have taken great faith for Laban to allow this stranger to take his sister, Rebecca, 550 miles away and marry a man that she or he had never met before. And so we see here the testimony and the proclamation of the servant was so convincing that Laban was moved to faith that this indeed was a work of the providence of God. So let's keep reading, picking up in verse 52. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. Notice again how, how moved the servant was by God's providence, that he again bows his head in humility and worshiped. Let's keep reading. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. And when they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days, and after that she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. I love Rebecca's faith and heart in this section as well. I mean, her awe in God's providence is seen here as she agrees with the servant, not even to wait, but she eagerly anticipates meeting her new husband. Let's continue on picking up with verse 59. And so they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, May you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebecca and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. And thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Now I'm going to come back actually to this section in just a bit, but uh, for now let's continue reading as we finish chapter 24 together. Now Isaac had returned from Beer La Roy. And was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. And so she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So now we come to this wedding scene, the culmination of this great story of God's providence. As Rebekah enters into the land of Canaan, the first person that she locks eyes with is providentially none other than her future groom, Isaac who just so happens to be in the field at the time of her arrival. Rebecca dismounts her camel, which was a form of modesty, and places a veil over herself, which was customary for a woman to do during this time of when she was betrothed. And so don't miss what happens in verse 66. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. 
And so we see once again the servant proclaiming God's loyal love which was demonstrated through his providence as he worked through the many different circumstances to bring Rebekah to Isaac. Well then Isaac, uh, now confident of God's providence in bringing him Rebekah, takes her to be his wife. And now we see this transition from Abraham to Isaac, from Sarah to Rebekah. God's promise to bring forth a great nation from Abraham is now moving forward through the promised son, Isaac. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that is encouraging to see how God's providence was so clearly demonstrated in the lives of the patriarchs, but I really haven't seen him working like that in my life before. And so what I want us to see as we close is that God's providence here to Abraham, to Abraham's servant, to Rebekah, and to Isaac is actually founded in the God's providential plan of salvation for all the nations. And so let me show you what I mean. Look back with me again at verse 60. It says, And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Here we have a short blessing placed over Rebekah, which actually is a repeat of, of the promise given to God, by God to Abraham concerning the offspring of his son Isaac in chapter 22. One simple promise which contains God's greatest plan of providence to ever be demonstrated in the entire cosmos. And so flip with me over to chapter 22 and look with me at what God says to Abraham concerning Isaac in verse 17. He says this, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Here in this future promise to Isaac in blessing placed over Rebekah lies God's greatest act of sovereignty and providence, a foreshadowing of hope that he would fulfill his ultimate plan of salvation to redeem and bless a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. You see, since the day our first parents were deceived in the garden by that vile and evil serpent, Satan, in aid of the fruit that God had commanded them not to, sin entered the world. And mankind was righteously cursed by God and plagued with the consequences of that sin. Romans 5.12 tells us, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. The rightful and just punishment, the wages and payment we were owed for our sin against a holy and righteous God was death and eternal separation from him in hell. And while mankind deserved nothing more than the wages due our sin, God was merciful and gracious. And he did not leave us in our deserved state of separation before the foundations of the world. God had already sovereignly planned a way to redeem mankind. And so while that enemy of God, Satan, succeeded in creating enmity between God and man, death would not have the final word. God would sovereignly, uh, God sovereignly proclaimed in the garden that the head of the serpent would be crushed by the offspring of Eve. And so 20 generations from Adam, his direct descendant, Abraham, appears on the scene. And God makes a covenant with Abraham, revealing a greater glimpse into his sovereign plan of salvation. God providentially gives Abraham and Sarah a son, Isaac. And what we see now in this story is that Isaac and Rebekah are promised an offspring who would possess the gates of his enemies. And 41 generations later, the promised offspring of Isaac appears on the scene. Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, the spotless Lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. He would offer up his perfect life as a substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of all who would repent and turn from their sin and place their faith in him. The promised offspring would bless the nations by rescuing them and bringing to himself a chosen people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Jesus willingly went to the cross on our behalf, died a substitutionary death, appeasing the wrath of God that was reserved for us, and once and for all conquered our greatest enemies, Satan, sin, and death through his resurrection from the dead. 
Christ's resurrection proved once and for all that God's providential plan of salvation could not be stopped. And even though the gates of his enemies were strong, God's sovereign arm was stronger. To him be glory and honor forever and ever. So church, as I close this message today, it's my hope that you will confidently be able to trust in the providence of God in every area of your life because you have seen just how faithful he has been in sovereignly fulfilling his promised plan of salvation. If he's already provided for our greatest need by sending us his son, Jesus, then can't we trust in his providence in all other areas of our lives? And so put your hope in, in, in your faith in Christ Jesus alone. And let's trust in God's providence as we pursue his will for our lives. As we pray for him to guide us, as we praise him for his answered prayers and proclaim his salvation and faithfulness to those around us. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful to have your word to remind us, to show us through all of the generations of man that you have been working your will. And that will was to bring about your plan of salvation. Lord, so as as we've seen just now in this story that you work everything according to your plan, that nothing can stop you from accomplishing what you want to accomplish would you help us to trust you more would you help us to uh, find hope and comfort in that even when we can't see even on this side of eternity when we never see uh, your providence in certain scenarios in our lives would you help us to know that um, we can still trust you that you are still holding us that you still care for us that your steadfast love is just that steadfast it never changes you have given us a covenant a new covenant through your son jesus we are sealed by the holy spirit and so may we trust in that lord would you uh, help us to be a people that seek uh, your will that seek your providence in our lives Uh, would you answer our prayers so that we can glorify you and trust you more lord you have been so faithful to this church In so many different seasons that we have faced, uh, you were providentially working. Lord, help us not to forget that. That in every season of doubt that we might have faced, that even that this church would continue on, here we are because of your, your will for this place. And so may we praise you for that. You are worthy of our worship, God. You are good to us and we forget how good you are. So, Lord, thank you for your grace when we forget. Thank you for our grace when we don't give you the glory that you deserve. Um, You are are so kind and compassionate to us. May we trust more in your son and the sacrifice that he made for us as we look forward to uh, his return where we will see our greatest enemies once and for all uh, cast away. And we live in eternity in joy with him. We pray this in the name of Jesus.